So, um, thanks very much. Um, I'd like to start with the elephant in the room. <laughs> Me. Um, yes, very pregnant, but I'm pretty confident I'm not going to go into labour on stage. But if I did, this is great preparation. Full of health professionals, my birth partner's in the room, uh, all eyes are on me, and I'm shifting myself. <laughs> um, so they did, Steve told me I had to be funny. Um, so I, <laughs> low bar, great. Um, so I've written you a little joke. What's the difference between a historian and a doctor? One requires a lot of patience, and the other requires a lot of patience. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it's not a great start, but I, I promise it'll, it'll pick up. Um, so I'm a historian of medicine, um, which means I need a bit of both. And the thing about medicine, very large field, capacious subject, history, arguably, there's even more of it. And so if you're an academic historian of medicine, like me, my sins, then you really need to specialise, you need to find your niche. And unfortunately, I found mine. <laughs> and it, it turns out that I am drawn to pretty miserable material. <laughs> I read a hell of a lot of incredibly depressing stuff all the time. Whether that's diaries of dying patients, letters from wounded soldiers, Replies to my tweets from angry men. <laughs> <laughs> so honestly, <laughs> relentless. Um, and so I'm taking a little bit of a risk here because, in my experience anyway, monologuing on pain, suffering, and death doesn't tend to make people laugh. It is, however, not a bad way to get a PhD. <laughs> so I mainly work on the history of cancer, the aforementioned sexy disease. Um, and I wrote a whole book on the subject, and you can read it if you want. It's available at all good university libraries, and none of the good bookshops, um, because it is an academic book, which means, admittedly, it does cost £85. Um, I've heard they've got a bit of a discount on signed copies, though, so giving them away. Um, so cancer is, as well as sexy, arguably the worst of the worst. You know, it's the disease that everyone kind of knows is just bad news. You don't have to know much about medicine to think, okay, cancer, not great news. Um, and unlike some of the other cheerier sicknesses, I could have studied cholera, tuberculosis, <laughs> typhoid, which have mostly, at least here in the UK, been well managed or, you know, in some cases entirely eradicated. Cancer is very much still with us. But, you know, admittedly, things have got better. And credit where credit is due, maybe to some of you in the room, treatments have certainly improved. Definitely since the 19th century, which is my favourite century, by the way. <laughs> Everyone knows the 18th century was weird, but the 19th century, <laughs> that's when things were starting to get good. Exciting new things happened in the 19th century. They invented railways, telephones, vibrators. <laughs> You might have had untreatable cancer, but at least you could call the vibrator shop to say your train's delayed. <laughs> Doctors, some of you guys, were also innovating in the 19th century. They were out there recommending cigarettes as a treatment for asthma, <laughs> injecting people with milk to cure them of dysentery, offering cocaine as a remedy for hay fever. <laughs> And stitching people into the carcasses of dead whales to soothe their arthritis symptoms. <laughs> Cocaine, injectable drugs, cigarettes, and waking up in whales. I haven't had a weekend like that since before I was pregnant. <laughs> when it comes to cancer, on the one hand, most of the treatments they used in the 19th century are pretty familiar. Surgery, fine. Chemo? Right, fine, okay. Even radiotherapy? Great, they're on it. But look a little closer, and things also start to get a little weird. One of the most popular remedies for cancer in the early 19th century was the oxygen treatment. Then, in the early 19th century, 
oxygen was a relatively new discovery. They were going around discovering all sorts of gaseous elements in the late 19th, 18th, early 19th century, inhaling them left, right, and center, <laughs> all the rage. Um, but one poor woman had an open sore on her breast, a degenerating malignant tumor. That's where it gets funny, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> she traveled cross country three times a week to some random doctor to inhale pure oxygen in the hope that it might heal the wound and cure her cancer. In a shock to absolutely no one here, the treatment failed. <laughs> and her friend wrote that she died, and I quote, breathing oxygen to the last. I mean, don't we all? <laughs> it's, not, it's not a eulogy I would personally want, but <laughs> maybe she had better friends somewhere else, I don't know. Um, another doctor was a keen advocate of what he called the rubbing method. <laughs> Women, mostly with breast cancer, would, would look at this doctor and be subjected to this uh, admittedly slightly dubious sounding treatment for some weeks. The remedy consisted of the physician applying rhythmic manual pressure to the site of the tumour with his bare hands. Much like cancer, the search for a cure for lecherous men continues to this day. <laughs> <laughs> Presumably you've all heard of arsenic, right? Famous, deadly, poison, beloved by Agatha Christie villains and the like. Well, the Victorians used it to powder their faces, dye their wallpaper, and yes, treat their cancers. They also used other famously poisonous things, like deadly nightshade, strychnine, mercury, and this might sound a bit extreme, but there was an underpinning logic, I promise. Victorian doctors had this idea that cancer needed what they called adversarial treatment. Cancer was a formidable opponent, and remedies needed to be toxic to stand a chance. <laughs> you just had to hope that they killed your cancer before they killed you. This idea, while logical enough, sometimes led doctors to some slightly strange areas of therapeutic expertise. Cancer patients in the 19th century were instructed to consume upwards of 400 grey lizards. <laughs> the evidence suggests that this treatment had poor outcomes for both human and lizards. <laughs> the patients invariably died, and the UK's lizard population hasn't been the same since. <laughs> Thankfully, as far as I know anyway, I'm no medical expert, our lizard eating days are behind us. I mean, you wouldn't even get 150 lizards on the NHS these days. <laughs> but who knows which of the many cancer treatments we use today might end up being played for laughs on a Friday night by some <laughs> medical historian with a penchant for the macabre. Thank you very much. Yeah.